You're okay. Oh. Just breathe, you. We're on. Right, we're on. Melee shaping. <laughs> Absolute, like, unexpected pleasure having the studio. Honestly, when uh, we got introduced not long ago, and it literally was not long ago, yeah. I was thinking, got to get this woman on the podcast. But at the same time, my head is going, no Zoom, cannot be Zoom, cannot be Zoom. When is this, is this ever going to happen? She lives in America. It's never going to happen. And now, what? Maybe 10 weeks down the line, you were in the HR studio. That's right. Thank you very much. For you, Hugh. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So, <clears throat> amusingly earlier, you did a very, what I think is a very American thing. I didn't realize it was an American thing until you did it. The, like, you did it and your husband did it. I'm embarrassed already. Right. Okay. And it was between taking a train and taking <laughs> an Uber. Right, train and Uber, equal cost, equal journey time. Ooh, hang on. Uh -huh. Uber's a bit quicker. Uh -huh. Uber's a bit quicker. Right, Uber's a bit quicker. But you chose the Uber over the train. Absolutely. I, I spent about 10 minutes going, what? <laughs> what is that? And I said to Kate, girlfriend. Yeah. I told her. And I went, am I mad? Or is that like a really American thing to do? And she went, yeah, what are they doing? It's proper American. I Train every time. I can't apologize for that, Hugh. No stops. <laughs> Directly from my hotel to here. Man, it's faster. And it was the exact same price. Well, I would, And it was raining out. Well, Kate's comment was, oh, uh, could I just have the menu, please, Uber driver? <laughs> no, you don't get a menu on there. There's no buffet service. You know, it's weird. Yeah, as they didn't serve me champagne. So that was that was strange here in the UK. No, I'm just kidding. No, it was great. I, I fully recommend it. I had a lovely British Uber driver. It was wonderful. Okay, I'll take your word for it. I'll take your word for it. I, I only do short journeys with Uber generally, only because I don't need to, and I don't sure. do any talk. I don't like talking in cabs. Yeah, most people don't. Anyway. British thing. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, I everyone has this thing. Google's amazing. <laughs> you go into Google, it's all fluffy and fluffy and clouds of pink and blue and candy floss everywhere. Sure. And, right. What's it really like working for Google? It's just like that. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it is more like that than people would imagine. Uh, there really is a giant slide. Um, there really are ball pits. There really are nap pods that you can like go into and close yourself in, take a nap. You serious? Uh, oh yeah. Um, there's you can get your hair cut on campus. You can get your car washed on campus. You can do your interview to get your global entry on campus. You don't have to go to the airport. Um, you know, I I had sushi. I had Indian food. I had, I mean, so yeah, you could you could live on campus. It's pretty awesome. Um, all oh, right, goodness yeah, me. It's the Sorry. rain. It's the rain, yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it's a lot like that. I'm not going to lie to you. And, you know, I would start every day with like a fresh pressed juice. This is starting to sound kind of bad, right? Uh, so they make it, they make it a, they make it in an environment you never want to leave, right? Because if you're always on campus, then you're always working. So everybody wins. But you live on campus. No, you, you don't technically live on campus. You have a bed somewhere else to go sleep in. <laughs> and other than that, you're on campus. Oh, my God. Yeah. And a gym. They have amazing gyms and lap pools. Yeah. Um, how, come you up, how, how come you ended up working for them? What were you doing? What was your expertise? It was a funny thing, actually. Um, when I graduated college, I was working for Bain Consulting, um, which just makes you a general expert. You're an, you can be an expert in anything, right? You learn how to learn really quickly. So you can go from there to pretty much anything. But what I actually went from there to do was to teach preschool. I, I love kids and I wanted to work with kids more directly. Um, to this day, hardest job I've ever had was teaching preschool and you're done by like 2 p.m. But it'll just kick your ass. Um, trying to keep a lot of people alive, literally, will kick your ass. So uh, I was teaching preschool and Google found me on LinkedIn and they were looking to fill a family and education marketing role. So they were looking for someone with like a generalist background who also had a clear connection to education. And I mean, you want to talk about like an offer you can't refuse. They, uh, you know, I, I went through a sort of truncated interview process and they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. What year was this? That was in 2016. Okay. I started at Google. Yeah, so like yeah. that was like... I think back what my perception of Google was then <laughs> that was the height of oh my god this is the greatest company to work for on the planet oh yeah maybe second only to 
the work and the environment I heard what that Facebook was like. Oh, really? They yeah. have a they have an equally cool sort of they're perceived to be equally cool. Well, I thought they were. I've been to the Facebook HQ in yeah. London. Oh, cool, yeah. And uh, that was pretty funky. I yeah. mean, what I envisaged Google would be like. When I say that, funky, I mean, just colourful. It wasn't like sure. walking and it's separated <laughs> workspaces and everything's grey and white and black. Yeah. It was just, just quirky. And they had, uh, what I don't know, what, oh, what would you call them? You know, street dispensers, candy dispensers. Oh, sure. On one of the floors and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. that sounds right. Yeah, okay. I mean, with it, there are boring buildings too. Like, you know, I've worked in more boring buildings that have more of the gray and the cubicles. But generally, every building has at least something quirky, usually. So, so if that's how you started off there. Yeah. <laughs> what did you end up doing to take it to Kenya? Yeah. Or even traveling internationally? Yeah, I, I did a lot of travel for Google. Actually, <clears throat> it was interesting because uh, Google is this massive company, right? But generally, and I think anyone who works there would tell you, it's sort of run like a startup. Things move a million miles per hour and or, you know, kilometers per hour, what, whatever your preference is. Uh, and, uh, and, and roles are always changing. So literally, I accepted the role. And by the time I showed up for my first day of work, which wasn't a huge uh, amount of time later, they were like, oh, that role no longer exists. Um, so we've reassigned you to the Android team. So I didn't really know... You know, if I'm being totally transparent, I didn't know if I wanted to do that. I, I came to do families and education marketing. Um, but then I got put on this team, which is like the best people I've ever met to this day. Most amazing people. Um, and so a lot of what we were doing was trying to understand how people use their Android phones. Or if you don't use an Android phone, why not? Or how do you perceive your Android phone? How does that vary around the world? Things like that, right? Um, are you an Android user? I am. Yeah, well, okay. I, yeah Andrew, and I've got an iPhone for work. Oh, but this kind both. of stuff fascinates me. Oh, fascinates okay, so me too. Me. Big nerd. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's interesting, I think, in my marketing role, I did a lot of traditional marketing, right? We made commercials and we did, you know, internet campaigns and things like that. But um, I also did a ton of research. And I think any great marketer should do a ton of research, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, you're marketing to a lot of people you don't necessarily understand. And if you're making assumptions, you're probably wrong a lot of the times. Um, so I did, a, I did a ton of research, a ton of sort of user studies, watching people use their phones, you know, behind a, a one-way mirror, things like that. Um, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Explain <laughs> that to me, that particular thing. Where, what were, were they brought in as subjects to be observed? Yeah. Yeah, they, they get paid. You know, they know they're coming in. <laughs> they know they're coming in for research. Um, but those are really cool because you get you get this really genuine cross-section of the population, right? You might have people who have six-figure tech jobs. You might have people who are, are teachers. You might have, you know, stay-at-home moms. You get such a cool cross-section of the population. Um, and they don't know what they're there to do. So a lot of times you give them a piece of software that hasn't been released yet for them to try out. And you get these really cool moments that never occur to you, right? I remember watching one. So, yeah, so we're behind like a... You know, we can see in. They You're can't spying. see us. Yeah, like you know, got it. Like Google does. Got it. Oh, I'm I'm out on that comment. <laughs> um, no comment. I plead the fifth. Um, but uh, you know, we're behind the glass, and you see these really cool m moments where uh, people get stuck. You know, they don't know they're supposed to press this or that button, or they don't know how to get back um, from a screen, and you'll see that confusion happen over and over and over right like six different people will all have the same problem that never occurred to you because of course that's a back button to you right but that's why you know there's a middle step there's research before we release a product to the public and even then it's not always perfect right but the research is really interesting so that was a cool cool thing we did um sometimes you even set up a whole fake environment to see how people interact with the environment yeah it's a whole thing um but i also traveled to do a lot of research so um, toward the end of my time at Google, I was working on what they call digital well-being. So how can we, uh, how can Google as a company improve your relationship with your device, right? Make you resent your device less or maybe use it less, um, which is a crazy thing, right? To work at, work on while you're at a tech company. How do I get you off your phone so you can be a happier person? Um, yeah. Why... Yeah, like you said, that's, that sounds counterintuitive <laughs> when it comes to making money. What what was the reason for that initiative? If it, or well, the initiative still exists, maybe. Sure, yeah. So you could say it's philanthropic, right? Oh, we want people to be happier. Um, what I tend <clears> to say <throat> is you can look at it from a money business perspective, right? And it still makes sense. 
if you hate your phone and you hate the way it makes you feel, what are you going to do? Eventually, you're going to think about getting a flip phone or getting rid of that phone or deleting all your apps. You're going to there's going to be a much more severe backlash to how you feel about that device, right? Um, if we can help you, if, if a tech company can help you regulate that usage so that when you put your phone down every day, you're like, damn, that thing is helpful. I'm so glad I have it. Then you're going to be a much more sustainable long-term user, right? So even if you just want to think about it in terms of money, tech companies should want their end users to feel good about how they use their phones. I would buy with that company you could achieve that aim so yeah. to make you think <laughs> that is incredible but also not make you want to jump straight back on it out of some addiction exactly. I, you mentioned about there about removing apps and getting a flip phone yep. i literally i bought a flip phone recently yeah i've deleted all the apps yeah Hon honest honest to god yep. so that's got bet this phone here yeah um, android has got in fact flipping huawei yeah oh yeah huawei <sighs> right. cool brand um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> bit of a history removed it all and feel a lot better for it but yeah. things creep back in yeah things creep back in out of necessity some some of it others not absolutely so that's actually quite admirable yeah and i'm I mean, mildly surprised but it makes sense yeah, actually. it does it make makes sense. sense exactly yeah, makes sense. and and what we know about sorry now i'm really nerding out but what we know about using your phone and in particular social media um and games right is that you actually do get utility out of that usage for a minute for a few minutes usually something like 20 minutes in total per day it makes you happier you're like oh man look what my uncle is up to how neat and your utility is increasing from that usage and then you don't hit a plateau you hit a really sheer drop off and in fact if you map that sorry if you map that drop off you can end up much much less happy than when you started and that's that resentment that people have right and because so much technology is built to suck you in on purpose to fire you know dopamine response so that you keep using it you don't realize that you've gone from here all the way down here until you finally put your phone down and then you go man i feel like shit i never want to use that thing again it sucks where did all my time go but if in fact if tech companies could get you to put your phone away at that peak you'd be much happier no and we are going way off on the tangent way this off is fascinating <laughs> however we're going to stay on this Good. tangent for one second right? yeah sure so no things I've, I've observed with my kids yeah so I was really worried with my experience with the phones for that exact, that sure. exact thing, getting fed up with them yep. and really affecting concentration and yeah. all, all the rest of that focus yep. stuff. And then eventually realizing I've far too long, my phone, my yeah. phone, too much time on it, right? Yeah. It doesn't seem to have the same effect yeah. on my kids. It's almost like, well, it's not almost like, and I think that's down to, you're going to correct me in a minute if I'm wrong. No, no, it's I'm interested. It's down to, we got, we got bombed with this technology in our adulthood, it's part of it. completely changed everything. Go, yep. wow, this is amazing, not realizing the impact of it. Yep. It doesn't do the same thing. It hasn't done the same thing to my kids. Yeah. I don't think. Did you do did you uh did you spy on children? <laughs> no. <laughs> Unequivocal, no. I've never spied on children. Um I could we interviewed a ton of we interviewed a ton of families, a ton. And so actually, um, and I don't mean to I don't mean to judge you. I don't know what your family's like. Uh, my favorite interview that we did, uh, we were we were in this family's home. They invited us, you know, into their home, and we're talking to all of them: two parents and two kids, maybe like fourth and sixth grade, right? So, but in that in that age, the parents really worry about, and the parents are saying, you know, we do our best. We've instituted all these rules: no phones at dinner, family movie night every Wednesday, um, no social media, right? All these rules, usage times and limits, and they have to turn their phone in at night when they go to bed, right? And uh, and I, oh, okay. And how does that go? Oh, we take a ton of flack. The kids hate it, right? They want to use their phones the way they want to use their phones. Okay. And we turn to the kids. And my research team asked the smartest question I've ever heard. Do your parents follow the rules they set for you? And the kids die laughing, right? They're like, of course not. They say they take our phones at dinner and then we sit at dinner and watch them use their phones. And so I think really that's a lot of the difference is for kids – there's so much conscious monitoring of how they're using their devices, right? Their parents are watching that for them and they're not getting bombarded with work texts, right? So most of what they get to do is fun anyway. Um, but we suck at monitoring ourselves. We're so bad at it. Mm. I used to ask people, how much time do you think you spent on Facebook this week? And they'd say, oh, two hours, right? Maybe it's been a real, it's In bad. A week. Yeah. And they'd be like, it's bad. I've been on Facebook a lot. It's two, probably, probably two full hours this week. Um, and on your phone, you can see how much time you've actually spent on Facebook. I kid you not. One woman said two hours to me, and the answer was 13 hours. Oh, and you know who guessed it right for her? 
her 12 year old son her 12 year old son from the other side of the room was like mom there's no way it's been two hours closer to 10 and she was like sweetheart that's crazy sure enough 13 hours so yeah i mean that's right someone's monitoring it for you and no one's monitoring it for us and we suck at monitoring it for ourselves so and we suck at monitoring ourselves yeah exactly yeah, it gets yeah, away yeah, from yeah, us yeah. absolutely why was you why what was the research you're doing overseas then yeah, so super closely related. Um, what we find is that in particular in the United States, people have this really negative, resentful relationship with their devices. And we don't see that overseas. And we wanted to understand why that was. Are we headed toward something similar? You know, are, are people in, in India and Africa going to end up feeling the same way about their devices that we feel? Or is there something inherently different about the way they use their phones, their their cultural identity, their religion, something that changes the way that relationship develops. Sorry. No, please. What kind of, which countries predominantly was, what kind of countries predominantly was this? Specifically India and Africa were the places that we saw a much less resentful relationship with devices. You trying to come up okay. with a theory? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, partly. Okay. But probably one of the factors is they've got actual real world problems yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. So poverty. Mm hmm so the phone can't afford to be as much they don't have as much spare time to worry about being on the phone distracting themselves with that they've got to worry about getting food water getting a dollar to feed the kids at night yep. one of the factors maybe definitely and and in fact sort of the add-on to that is that they need that phone the phone is a lifeline in a country like that right where you're facing poverty i remember one woman told us uh, my son was very very ill and i couldn't afford to take him to the doctor and so i spent the little bit of data that i had to search his symptoms and I found a um, like a like a medicinal remedy that I could make for him at home and it broke his fever and he got better within 24 hours and my son would be dead if I didn't have this phone I don't know if that's right or wrong but it was her belief and so if you truly feel that your device is your lifeline and it's it's literally helping to keep you alive um, then obviously much less resentment, right? It's it's so much more valuable and and um, conspicuously valuable, right? You see that that value every day. So that was a huge part of it. And then something that I loved when we were in India was every family, no matter sort of what the socioeconomic status was uh, of the family, someone in that family would say, "Hey, man, it's all about balance." Be like, "I love my phone because." You know, I play games on the train all the way to work, and then I work all day, and it's handy. You know, I text, I email, I take phone calls, and then I play games on the train on the way back, and then I put it away and hang out with my family. And it's just great. I love I love the balance of that. And so I, I just felt like there was a focus on balance in all things with the families that we spoke with in India that I think we forget all the time, that, that we don't institute in our lives. So I love that. I try to remember that. I suck at it, but I try to remember that. Yeah, I think it's less obvious, isn't it? The, yeah. the necessity of those interpersonal relationships, family, tribe, exactly. community. What did I what did I read yesterday somewhere? And it was and it was this morning. And the saying was it was a proverb from I don't know I know. I c I'll remember who it was. Mm -hmm. But it was um the 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 tribe mm. who does not love the the son of the tribe mm -hmm. who is not loved by the tribe mm -hmm. will burn the tribe to the ground mm. to feel the warmth yeah like, okay that makes sense <laughs> that's a, I mean <laughs> yeah just more broadly so much impact right <laughs> I always say that the people we should worry about the most are the people with nothing to lose and it's kind of kind of like that you know mm -hmm. no one should feel like they have nothing to lose that's a person who's going to do something scary right yeah so so were you midway through that research when you got brought to Kenya yeah yeah so I spent a week in Mumbai um, actually stopped in uh, in Dubai for the weekend in the UAE. Oh, you went straight from India or over? Okay. To the du yep, to Dubai. Uh, just you know, personal trip for me for the weekend since I had to be in Kenya the following week. It's a lot easier than coming all the way back. Um, and then I was only slated to be in in Kenya doing that research for two and a half days, all in Nairobi. So super short trip. <laughs> so were you engaging with other? Were you supposed to be engaging with other businesses there, or researchers, or was it directly with the, com with the communities or what? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I had a uh, research team that was based in the U.S. They didn't work at Google. They worked for a third party company um, and they set up all the interviews. So we would go, you know, I had a couple of representatives from that research team and I was, you know, the Google representative on the trip. And so as a team, we'd go out into these people's, you know, homes and, and we'd set up a camera and do something a lot like what we're doing right now and 
ask them about how they feel about their devices and how they use them. So it was it was incredibly interesting. And when you travel to these places, just out, I say out of interest, and absolutely yeah. on on topic, actually. <laughs> Do you did you get uh, so when I travel for work, mm -hmm. we get maybe it's because of the product at the time since, oh. but um, threat briefs, in briefs. Oh. So when you were traveling about, did you get those off of? Did you get those off of anyone? Because sometimes it's it's outsourced, right? But did you have those going into any places like well, M Mumbai would be a perfect example? Um, uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Short answer to your question. Uh, no, I didn't. Um, Google, I reached out to the security team at Google and they put together a short sort of document for me. I, actually, I think they already had it. So I was like, I'm traveling to Nairobi. They were like, here's the the document um, that just sort of briefly outlines, you know, biggest threat to you is probably petty theft or road accidents, things like that. You know, make sure you don't carry a ton of valuables with you in public. Don't walk by yourself at night. Those kind of things. Were you on your own when you were there? To Kenya? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I landed uh, from the UAE and uh, um, Google had arranged a driver for me. So I met my driver at the airport and then he took me uh, back to my hotel that night. Uh, <laughs> I take it he was a local yes. driver? Yeah. Not like a Google employee no, in no, no, Kenya? No. no, local driver. What was he like? He was the best. He was the best. Um, oh, I just, I think about him all the time. I know that's funny, but uh, he was so... Nice. I know that's just a, a funny way to describe someone, but he was so nice. He was so easy to talk to. Um, and he was great at explaining the cultural context that I was so much missing. <laughs> you know, I really didn't know anything about Nairobi. It's, it's embarrassing in retrospect. Um, I didn't know about the history of terrorism there. I didn't know about the, you know, the influx of, of Islamic extremists from, from Somalia and and he was so patient explaining those things to me and and not patronizing, you know. So he was just the best. Before and yeah. So oh, so he you were getting like the full lowdown, the full local lowdown of the driver. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I'm always you can tell I'm chatty, so I'm always the one to ask questions <laughs> and be like, tell me about your life and tell me about where you live. And so yeah, I was asking. You know, the the second morning. I was up in the gym really early, and then uh, he he drove me actually to see the the sanctuary for the elephants. And then there's a place where you can the baby elephants, and then there's a place where you can hand feed giraffes. And so on all those drives, he was talking about that cultural context. And I remember I remember saying I had no idea that there's terrorism here in Kenya, which in retrospect is is crazy not to have known. But and I asked him like. Is that something you worry about on a daily basis? You worry about terrorism here in Nairobi? And he was like, yeah, of course. Mm. And, uh, and I just couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe that in a city that I had expected to feel um, very like a, like a developing nation, I thought in a lot of ways it didn't. There was such great infrastructure and these beautiful five-star hotels and you know just so much like bustling life. And it was hard to imagine that all of those people were consciously living under this threat, this very real threat of like, you know, how long till the next terrorist attack? It's just crazy. On the day of the attack, yeah. in hindsight, was there anything you remember that was different in that build up to the actual attack happening Ooh. in the morning beforehand? Because a lot of the time in these this things, people think back and go, oh my God, yeah, that was that place was a bit quiet or this was different or the X, Y, or Z or the police seemed a bit on, 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 on pins for some reason. Um, or was it another two, I guess normal? two things. And I don't, that's probably, t probably total nonsense, but, um, just the thing I always think back about is that the traffic, the traffic was so bad that I couldn't get to the interview. I was supposed to be at an interview when the attack happened at the hotel. You weren't meant to be even be in oh, there. Certainly not. No. Um, and my my research team was out at that interview, and we couldn't get there because traffic was so. They they had gotten out there early, and and we couldn't get there because traffic was so bad. We were going to be like an hour late, and it's like an hour and a half interview. So it's like, okay, uh, what's the point? So, but traffic is always bad, so I don't think that's unusual. But it's just one of those things that I think back on that if traffic hadn't been so bad that morning, I wouldn't have been in the attack. So it's more you know one of those strange things for me. Um, but the thing that I noticed that really shook me in retrospect. Um, was it that morning I was in the gym crazy early because of the jet lag and uh, and two people brought in these big duffel bags and 
it's super customary in Kenya to um, to wave and to smile. Like I feel like every I'm from the Midwest, right? Okay, in the U.S., people wave and smile. This was like another level. I felt like everybody, you know, wave and smile, stop, say something. Um, so I was on a spin bike, and and this man came in first with this big duffel bag, and and what I noticed actually was just that he didn't make eye contact with me, and I like I tried to like catch his eye and wave. Um, and he looked at the ground and took the bag into the locker room. And then just a few minutes later, a woman got off the elevator, huge duffel bag, same thing, wouldn't make eye contact, took it into the locker room. And I was up there for another 20 minutes and neither one of them ever came back out. Um, so maybe it's nothing. Maybe it was like a, you know, rendezvous. Maybe they were hooking up. I hope it was something nice. But in retrospect, what I realized that was so strange was that they weren't in workout gear. And they weren't in hotel uniforms. So it's strange. If you're staying in the hotel, why didn't you change your clothes in your room? And if you're an employee, wouldn't you be in your clothes, like your your hotel uniform, and then change into workout gear? Um, maybe not. Maybe you came from your house. and But again, why not come in your workout gear? So the whole thing was strange. Um, so I always wonder, you know, ultimately at the end of the attack, two of the terrorists end up holding up – or, yeah, two of the terrorists end up holding up in the gym – and there's a long, long standoff that happens, you know, while they're in the gym. And I just wonder, was that preparatory? You know, were there grenades in those bags? I don't know. How big were the bags? Big. Big, like big duffel bags. Like two handles. Yeah. So quite likely it was pre-planned drop of weapons, knowing that that's where the, the last stand would be. I mean, total, total guess on my part, right? Just a hypothesis is something I've never been able to verify. Um but yeah, that would be my guess because it's a crazy coincidence to think that these huge bags were coming in at a time when no one was really supposed to be in the gym and then the terrorists worked so hard to get up to the gym for why was, that Why last was no day. one supposed to be in there? It's just a weird time, right? Why would anyone be in the gym that early? What time was it? Um, man, it was like, I think I was basically in there from like 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. Jesus. Yeah. What are you doing, you lunatic? Uh, <laughs> Honestly, I was not working out very hard. I just couldn't sleep. I was on the spin bike for like a long time listening to an audiobook, not going very, very Probably the worst quickly. thing to do for trying to get to sleep is working out. Well, I had already <laughs> given up on trying to go to sleep. I figured I'd, I'd just work out. Um, you know, so weird time for people to be in there. So, When did you first realize things were not going to go to plan that day? When did, things, when, when did you realize it was going to Pete Tong? It was what? When did you realize it? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> when did you realize it? Pete, Pete Tong. Pete Tong wrong. When did you realize oh. it was going to? Sorry, sorry. When did you realize it was Going wrong. Um, I mean, like, logistically, when I couldn't get to the interview, I was like, oh, damn, I was really looking forward to that. I'm only here for two and a half days. Shame. I mean, catastrophically wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I missed that interview. My driver dri dropped me off at the hotel. And that's weird to think about, right? You think about, I was walking through the lobby and up to my room 30 minutes before the attack started. So I think back about, on that a lot. Did I notice anything? Did it feel weird? Um Oh, from the gym. But I didn't. No, no. I from the gym. I went and got ready. I went out to the to the elephant sanctuary. Saw the giraffes. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, and then uh, and then unfortunately was unable to go to my interview, which was sort of the thing I was supposed to be doing. Um, so he dropped me at my hotel at like three, and yeah, it's like thirty. I mean, the terrorists must have been right around the corner, right, ready, ready to come in. I'm sure the I'm sure the vest was on the suicide bomber, and he was in the in the cab. Um, so. Uh, but yeah, no, no idea. And even in retrospect, I don't, I don't remember anything strange. I remember saying hi to the folks at the front desk. There's a metal detector at the front. You know, you have to go through a metal detector and they check your bag. And I did all those things and I went up to my room. So I was, uh, I was texting with my dad and I was actually packing my bags. I was, I was really excited. I was supposed to go to South Africa the next day, see some, you know, safari stuff. And uh, so I was packing up my bags and putting them by the door so I'd be all ready to go to the airport. And I was like, man, I'm tired. Been up since 3 a.m. It's like almost 3.30. I think I'll take a nap and uh, wait for my research team to get back. So I crawled into my bed and uh, and I've never found the right words to describe this. But, but this explosion happened that was so intense. And, it, and what I mean by intense is it was way too close, right? Like Sometimes you hear something in the distance, you're like, that was really loud, or, or there's a, a shooting range in the distance or whatever, and you can tell, you know, that's quite loud, but it's really far away. This was so loud and so close that, like, I sh it shook me in my bed, you know, where I, was, where I was lying, and it's just this instant when you say, when did you realize it was catastrophic? 
that was catastrophic. You know, so you thought, could like feel the pressure changing in the air. Yeah, and, and my ears were ringing. I couldn't hear. Um, I was screaming. Actually, I couldn't hear myself screaming in in the moments right afterward. Um, I was just screaming like, no, 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 because you just, I mean, everything in my brain was like, uh, this has just gone so far off the rails. I, I'm confused as to why I'm not dead. It felt like the building was coming down. What was your immediate thought of what it was? Like that immediate thought when, when you felt that blast? I was trying really hard. <laughs> my brain was 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 sort of in this survival mode almost immediately. And, and I was trying really hard to think of anything that could explain something like that that didn't mean that I was going to die, right? I was like, a gas pipe exploded. What would that sound like? Or, you know, uh, someone ran, crashed a car through a door, you know, something that could possibly explain. And, and even then, I think I knew it, it can't be. It can't be. Like a, a bomb just went off right outside my room. So I... I ran over to, you know, I had this big window that looked down on the courtyard right outside my room. And I ran over to that. And I actually couldn't get the curtains open for a minute because my hands were shaking. And finally, I wrenched them apart. And uh, and then I knew instantly. I could see, um, sorry, this is kind of gross, but um, I could see a leg, a, a human leg that had been detached from a body, still had the shoe on it and everything, um, lying there in in the courtyard. And I was like, that was a bomber. That was a suicide bomber. Was there any other people in the area? What were they doing? So it's weird, actually. Um, the spot that I looked down on, when I looked down, I saw smoke, ton of smoke, and and this leg. And I didn't actually see people running through quite yet. Um, what I did see was uh, gunmen with AK-47s. And they were coming like through the courtyard, kind of... M exactly the wrong direction for if you were part of, you know, if you were surprised by that explosion and you happened to be sort of caught up near it, you'd have run definitely out of the courtyard, out of the hotel, out of the complex. Um, and these guys were, were coming in. And so my first thought actually was they're going to look up and see me. I don't know why I was so worried about that. Um, and so I immediately started fumbling to get my curtains shut again. What, what floor are we on? I was on three, Okay. but it's, well, you guys are like this too, but you know, in Africa there's ground and then there's one, two, three. So in the US there's one, two, three, four. <laughs> oh, okay. So you, you were on what? American three or British three? I was on British three. British three. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, by looking at them. So you obviously made a quick assessment mm -hmm. and thought those are bad guys, terrorists. Mm -hmm. what, what were they, what were they wearing? Man, I couldn't tell from my vantage point exactly what they were wearing. I remember. Well, I suppose the first combat indicator is not uniforms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're not in uniforms, and they've got AKs, right? And I could see the AKs from my room. So that was about all I gleaned from looking down. And I recognized, like, one was, you know, the FBI asked me afterward, and I was like, oh, I guess if I think about it, one was taller and slimmer, and one was shorter and heavier than the other. But I didn't, you know, I didn't know that they were wearing vests or whatever from, from that vantage point. Um... I just knew I literally had been talking to my driver that morning about terrorism in that area. And so it was, I mean, it was immediate that I was like, well, for all those people wondering when the next one will be, it's today. Oh my God. Yeah. Did the, did the hotel have security? Yes. <laughs> the hotel had security. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. There are a lot of uh, theories about, where security went that day and i i don't know um like i said typically they've got uh people at the front door running your bags through metal detectors i don't think the terrorists were gonna let them do that um so and then they've got security guards out at the kind of at the street they check they check the car and they open the gate and let you go in so when the the suicide bomber went off do you mm -hmm. know what they were targeting when you looked out was it were they targeting anything particular or were they just in the courtyard of the hotel no what? there's a restaurant out there called the oh. secret garden yep so they were definitely i mean it's a bit strange, you know, again, a lot of theories in retrospect, um, but people are, you know, sitting around at 3 p.m., people are 3.30, people are sitting around, uh, you know, eating at the at the restaurant, and he was right by, you know, where they were enjoying their lunch, basically. What was your first thought after realizing what it was? I'm dead. That was my first thought. I'm dead. That's, just, that's it. I'm dead.
How did you deal with that? What did you do when you think you're going to die? I said goodbye to my family. I mean, I mean, I it wasn't like, oh no, I hope I don't die or like what could I possibly do to survive? It was holy shit, I'm dead. Like this is how I die. Um sort of a shocking moment. Maybe that's uh maybe that's my privilege talking, you know. I just Was it a was it a moment of clarity? Was it like a, a, a I don't mean like in a no, positive yeah. way. Was it like a, uh Yeah. This is it full stop. Yeah. Time to make my peace kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it went from sort of confusion of like what's happening trying to get the curtains open oh my god what am i looking at that's a leg the gunman oh i'm dead i know exactly what's happening this is the end of of my life i'm 26 years old and this is it this is how i die did you have regrets no did your life flash before your eyes no (laughs) <laughs> no, everybody asks. What me you that. do? It's a weird situation, right? And and, and yeah, they sound like I'm I'm not trying to ask. I mean, there were sort of rhetorical questions. No, the no. Say, I realized you had that moment yeah. when you are you are fully yeah. conscious. You're yeah. fully there, fully present. Yep. How did you How did you address the fact you're going to die? What did you do? Oh, man, I thought if I have ten seconds left, the only thing I want to do is tell my family I love them that's it right like I didn't it takes a little bit of extra mental space to think back on your life or wish you had done things differently it takes time and a little bit of mental energy right and I didn't think that I had either of those things I certainly didn't have the mental energy and I I literally thought I maybe have enough time to send a text to my family you know you don't know is a bomb going to go off in the lobby next is a bomb going to go off outside my door next are they going to break my door down and shoot me I don't know but I'm not making it out if you're alive right um and so I, I got my phone and I texted my family and I said, there's a terrorist attack on the hotel. I love you. And I just, I just thought, man, <laughs> the thing about it is if terrorists are going to kill you, terrorists are going to kill you, right? Your life's over. You're done. What can you possibly do to help the people who have to live in the wake of that tragedy? Because I wasn't going to have to live in the wake of it, right? I was going to be dead. I wanted them to know the last thought she had wasn't, I'm scared or I have regrets or I wish I could get away. The last thought she had was, I love you guys. It just, it was, it was true. It was the last thought that I had. So, and then I think, then there was this moment of, okay, I'm not dead yet, what do I do? And it went back into sort of the the confusion and, and the mess of like, is there any way to extend my my life here? What was going on in the immediate aftermath while you were having these these thoughts and, t- and, and sending the texts uh, w- outside was, because where did those gunmen go? Yeah, I, so I'm not great at the like specifics of, of their route. Uh, my understanding, and I, I could be misstating this, so I apologize. My understanding is that they basically <sighs> corralled a bunch of people who were trying to get away uh, and into this area where there was a small pedestrian gate, and uh, the gate was locked. And so they gunned down a bunch of people who were trying to get through the gate. Um, you know, I think at that time they're kind of looking for easy targets. Who, who can they pick off that's, that's available to them, that's outside trying to, trying to run away, trying to get away. Um, and so you could hear the gunshots. I could hear the gunshots from inside. Um, but I could also tell they weren't immediately outside my door, right? Um, so, yeah, so you start trying to figure out, is there, is there a way for me to live? What leads that decision making? Had you had so what knowledge were you drawing on? Did you had you had any briefings, training whatsoever in any, in any situation, any career, or anything in the past that would help in that situation? And if not, how are you making those decisions? How do you decide what to do when you haven't got the knowledge to know what is the absolutely the correct thing? Yeah. If there is an absolutely correct thing <laughs> in such a situation, right? Exactly. Um, I can't think of a briefing that I ever would have received in my career or my personal life that that would have talked about any of the things uh, that were right to do in that situation. But um, I did call 
Google has sort of an emergency phone number that you can call from anywhere in the world if as an employee. And so I called that, and I, I talked to this amazing woman. I, I just sent her a signed copy of the book last week. Um, Melissa, she was, she was amazing, and she was calm, and she started giving me step-by-step instructions. And I, I swear <laughs> I would still be standing there. Like, like I was so frozen um, because I had no idea what to do. I had no knowledge. I had no training. Um, so she just started giving me really – tangible, actionable things, you know, turn off your lights, barricade your door with any furniture you can move, find a place to hide. Um, but by the time I found a place to hide, I thought, well, fuck, if they breach my door, it's barricaded. So they're going to know someone's hiding in here. Oh, so one of the things she asked you to do is barricade the door. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So it's like, should I unbarricade the door? You know, so. But it's like you said, there just there are no right answers when you're in a situation like that. You just, I guess, I guess someone said to me the other day, I guess it's right that if you walk out of there alive, you found the right answers. Could you hear any other guests in the hotel? Did you even know anyone else that was staying in there while this was going on? So, probably the most comforting thing to know was that my research team was out. I knew that they were not in the hotel, um, so that was that was good. You know. You, and transparently, the, the truth of it is that it wasn't my first thought. I was in full survival mode. It was like, how is there any way, is there anything that I can think of, right? And I'm a big nerd, so I'm like generally of the belief you can think your way out of most things. Not something like this, right? But is there anything I can think of that will allow me to get back to the people I love? And that was a lot of the experience at the beginning. So it was, you know, it was, there was some time before my brain had the space to be like, oh, holy shit, I'm so glad my research team isn't here, you know, um, and to try to think through, do I know anyone else? I didn't know anyone else in the hotel at that time. Um, and what's really interesting is that I never heard anybody screaming. I, ne- I either I missed it or I tuned it out or the, the, the gunshots were too loud or the grenades were too loud or it didn't happen. But I never heard any anybody like screaming in fear inside the hotel. After the uh, after the initial explosion, did the gun battle start straight away? As in the gunfire, the the, uh, the small explosions. Did that? But because how long did it last yeah. for? Mainly, what, what was it? Twenty two hours in total. Yeah, yeah. And the fighting started almost immediately. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, almost immediately. Um, yeah, it went on for a long time, but you know. There are longer ones, right? Westgate Mall lasted days. So I, I don't know. I don't know how you, I don't know how people live through something like that. It's, it's so taxing to hear gunshots, to wait for them to kill you for that long. And was Marissa on the phone the entire time? Nearly, yeah. So I was on the phone with security the entire time. I, I was in there for 17 hours and I was on the phone with security the entire time. Um, <clears throat> But they change the, their shifts uh, change every eight hours. So I talked to three different people in my in my seventeen hours. And um, what are you and were you in touch with your family the entire time as well? Yeah, people always ask me that. Um, yes, I was over text in touch with my family the entire time. Um, but I, I never called them. I never, I never considered calling them if I'm, if I'm being totally honest. Why and is that? that's really striking to people. I think it was because I can certainly tell you that if I had called my family, I would have broken down, Com- like completely broken down. If I heard their voices, if I had to say goodbye and try to, try to say something comforting and, and, and listen to the voices of the people I was never going to get to see again, I would have been rendered useless. I wouldn't have been able to do anything. And so I think in all reality, it was part of that survival mode. You know, I wasn't like looking at old pictures. I wasn't reminiscing on old memories and I wasn't, I wasn't trying to call them because I, I couldn't have, I would, I, I just would have broken down in a way that's like hard to put into words. Physically in the room, where were you (laughs) during this time? Uh, almost the entire time I was in the bathroom of my hotel room, the like attached bathroom. Um, but for the first hour I was sort of crushed. I crushed myself under a shelf that has like towels on it. Um, because (laughs) it didn't look like a place a person could fit. 
it was really small cramped area. It was like in the fetal position and I basically didn't fit. I like had massive bruising on, on my hip afterward from shoving myself into this spot. And then I pulled all the towels back in. So it just looked like, you know, like stack towels. I wouldn't have been very hard if you, you, you move a towel. You're like, oh, there's a girl hiding here. Um, but I just thought maybe it won't occur to them. I thought, you know, if I hide under the bed, that's obvious. People hide there. If I try to hide in the closet, that's obvious. In the in the action movies, someone always throws open the door to the closet. Um, but I've never seen anybody try to look behind the towels. And I don't know that it would occur to you. <laughs> so I was there for the first hour. Um, and I had my phone and I was... It was basically not answering, but but Melissa was talking to me and trying to remind me to, to breathe and calm down. And all I was thinking was, don't scream when they walk in. You cannot scream when they walk in. You'll want to scream when they when they bust your door down. But if you scream, they'll kill you. So I was just over and over and over, don't scream when they walk in. So was your entire focus fully there on, on literally on the door, footsteps in the corridor, the door, opening waiting for that moment while everything else is going on <laughs> yeah pretty much i i would say that 90 percent of my energy the entire time was dedicated to where are the sounds where are the gunshots coming from where are the explosions <clears throat> coming from on how many sides are the sounds coming from um and are they getting closer was like most of what my brain was doing how did you keep yourself switched on at that heightened state for that long time that it's, must uh, have been in <laughs> incredibly draining it is, it is draining, but it's also automatic. Like that's that switch, right, of, of uh, fight, flight or freeze, you know, it, that your body kicks on to, your body kicks that on instinctually when, when you're going to die to try to help you use every last reserve of energy, every bit of mental capacity to survive if you possibly can. Um, so it was automatic, but it was, it was draining. And it has really long-term consequences, right? When we go into fight or flight mode, or freeze mode, and we think we're going to die for that long, our brain has a lot of trouble turning that back off. It's really hard, and, and it has really long-lasting effects. So, But it keeps you alive. It kept, it kept me alive in that situation. When it, when it kicked off, mm -hmm. how long did you like think you'd be there for? Did you, th did you get to any point in that time and you thought, this is crazy? I've been here for this long. Oh, yeah. Many. <laughs> I thought that many, many times. Um, I don't think that I had a time limit in my head, um, but there were sort of erroneous reports that went out at different times. So, you know, more than once I was told on the phone, it's over. It's over. And the first time was a couple hours in. It's over. Uh, the terrorists have been neutralized. Let's book you a new flight. Let's get you to South Africa. You made it. And, uh, you know, you think about hearing that, and then hearing more gunshots, and then you're in there for another 15 hours after that, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I heard that a lot, but by the end, you know, my feeling was this will never end. You can't, it'll, it'll, this will never end. I will be in here one way or another until I die, because you just, it had become so familiar, not only the sounds and the fear, but the idea that people were gonna keep telling you it was over, and it wouldn't be. How'd you remain calm in the situation and not flip out? What stops you from freaking out? Did I not? From running out? It <laughs> oh, I, 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 doesn't sound like it. Uh, yeah. That was my support system. So I was getting texts the whole time. Um, like, mainly the safest place you could possibly be is in your room. Do not leave your room. Do not leave your room. And I think people take for granted, like, oh, of course you wouldn't leave your room. There's no need to say that. But it was so important hearing that because there were moments that I can, you know, vividly remember of the panic taking over, of like run for your fucking life. Just fucking run, just run. Like you are going to die if you keep sitting here. Just run, at least then you have a chance. Um, and that was that was the panic talking, right? Like fully taking over. Um, and so it was just, it took all of my energy to, to read those texts and go, okay, this is the safest place I could possibly be. Uh, okay, just just keep waiting, just keep sitting here. But you know. In retrospect, we joke that if I knew how it was going to turn out, I could have put in some noise-canceling headphones, watched a few movies, and then, you know, <laughs> gotten the hell out of there. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, at what point did you realize you're actually going to get out of it? When, you, when, when things started turning? 
when they came to my door to get me. Like I said, I really... Literally that last I, moment. Yeah, I really did not believe. You start to feel like a fool to believe that it's going to end, right? It's, it's exhausting to be like, it's over, it's not, it's over, it's not. You're going to live. JK, you're probably still going to die. Um, so yeah, it, it wasn't conscious. I just started to be like, yeah, okay, sure. You'll be here soon to get me. Like, I know, I know everybody was trying their best and I don't mean to take away from that. Like, that was definitely the focus and, and where, you know, the response needed to be. Um, and I know they were trying so hard to come get me. Uh, but yeah, I didn't, I, I don't think I could have believed it until I saw them standing there. Um, American guys. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two American guys. So they had started calling me. Um, so we were in touch and they would give me sort of periodic updates about how things were going. And, and they told me, you know, we're going to come get you when this is all over. And, uh, and I tried, I tried, like I wanted to believe that, you know? Um, but sure enough, after 17 hours, they knocked on my door and called my name. And I remember the security person I was on the phone with was totally right in saying like, don't open your door when you don't know who it is. Um, and I was like, yeah, but they know my name. And they're like, and like, don't open your door until they can sort of prove, you know, that, that they're good guys. And I was like, Yeah. It's been 17 hours, I'm out. And I like hung up the phone and opened the door. <laughs> At that point, you got out. It was still going on though, right? Yeah, it but was. above you? Uh, no, actually. Uh, my understanding in retrospect is that it was still going on uh, d downstairs um, in, the, in the basement. Um, I, d I don't know if that's correct. But uh, the, I do know for a fact that the terrorists had broken into two groups. And the, the first terrorists to be neutralized were the ones in the gym upstairs. Um, but yeah, I, I had no idea that it was still going on. It was quiet at that time. And they took me down to the lobby and I never, during that time, during my extraction, I didn't hear any gunshots. Um, and they put me in an armored car and, and we left. So I, I just assumed it was over. You know, I didn't, I didn't realize that extractions could go on while, while it was still ongoing. What kind of state were you in mentally when you opened the door? I mean, <laughs> were, were you, you know, cause you, I think in the book you mentioned about not not a disassociation, but you, like a almost a numbness. Yeah. Um. What was that like when they opened the door? I mean, wh <laughs> what was that? Sit I mean, that when they did that, I how did you receive them? How did they receive you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a I have a big personality, Hugh. So I was a lot. I'm sure from the time they opened the door. Um, for me, it was surreal, right? Uh. It was this thing like if you've ever had a dream that feels so – not a dream while you're sleeping, like a dream of something you'd love to accomplish one day. And it's so big and so crazy that it feels like you'll never accomplish it. But it's 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 beautiful to think about, right? There's like a 0.0001% chance that you'll ever get there. But wouldn't it be amazing? And it felt like that, right? Like I can't believe – they came. I can't believe they're here. I can't believe I'm alive 17 hours later and they're here. So it was super surreal. And I don't think that I've ever felt or ever could feel joy like that again. Like I get to leave, I get to leave. Um, but it certainly hadn't really processed yet that I lived, that I made it. So it's just this moment of like pure sort of joy and, and disbelief, I think, is probably the best way to put it. Where did, where did, <coughs> where did they take you afterwards? Where did you go? Where's the first place you go? Did you have a debriefing? No, we went straight out to have some lunch. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, they put me in an armored vehicle and uh, then passed me off to the FBI who had their own armored vehicle, American FBI agents. And... Uh, you know, everybody was associated with the embassy, I guess. And so they took us back to the embassy. There was another American survivor, too. Um, they took the two of us uh, to the to the U.S. embassy. And they, they clearly had sort of a, a protocol. You know, they run you through, like, medical evaluation to make sure you're not bleeding anywhere and psychological eval, which is kind of absurd because you haven't slept for, like, two days and you just walked out of a terrorist attack. What was the... What was that evaluation? I just remember this. She was lovely. I don't want to take any, anything away from this woman. She was really sweet. But I remember her asking me if I wanted to kill myself. And I was like, y you think, uh, do I want to? 
no, I don't want to kill myself. I've been working as hard as I possibly can to survive for the last 17 hours. I don't, I don't want to kill myself. Um, which, you know, would have been a much, much more pertinent question, like a month, a month later. Um, so it was kind of absurd to be asked that in the immediate aftermath, but I get it. They got a checklist, I'm sure, of things they have to ask. And then I sat down and did, did a debrief with the FBI. Did you realize then it was still going on inside? No, no, I still didn't. It was a few hours before uh, I had been in touch with the Kenyan special forces. And it was a few hours before one of them texted me saying it's over. And I was like, yeah, obviously. Um, and so I only only started to put together then that, that it had still gone on for several hours even after I left. And just like the horror of of that. It was so unfathomably long already to me. And yet somehow it wasn't even over. It's crazy. Have you, uh, did you ever, have you ever spoken to the, the, your driver? Oh. Since that. Um, I no, say to never him, spoken. Remember that conversation we had that morning? <laughs> yeah. No, I've never spoken to him. I, th- I actually think about him, as I was saying, I think about him a lot and I get that question a lot. Like, are you still in touch with him? Um, so if he ever wants to reach out to me, he's welcome to. But uh, no, I haven't talked to him since, but. And see, I might get emotional saying that. I can say all this stuff, but you asked me about my driver and I might cry. Um, he came back to the hotel while the attack was going on and he waited there all night until they got me out and, and he saw me leaving in the armored car and, and he waved and and I, text, I texted him then like, oh my God, you know, you're here. And he was like, yeah, I wasn't going to leave until I, until I... <laughs> I wasn't going to leave until I knew you were okay. And it's like a stranger to me, right? Like I had known him for like a day and a half. Um, But he knew that I didn't have anybody in Kenya to be my support system. And so he came there to be that for this like 26-year-old girl he barely knew. And he literally waited all night until he saw them bring me out. And I, I think that's really cool. I think in a time of seeing the worst things that humans can do to one another to see just like just genuine kindness. Like he didn't expect anything from me. He didn't do it for any reason other than like human compassion. It was just like one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me. Yeah. One of the things uh, I've noticed when I've been out there <coughs> to Africa yeah. a couple of times I have, is how in- incredibly kind and compassionate they are. Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's a different level. Absolutely. It is a, uh, your case in point, which yeah. is an extremist mind. For sure. An extremist. Sure. friend of mine, he's also got like money to make, he's got a job, and he, and he waits there on like incredible people. Exactly. Incredible people across the board, regardless of the country. It's 100%. Inc- incredible people. Yep. What happened then? What's that immediate aftermath like in those days <laughs> after, as in reconciling what's just gone down? How long was it until you got to a sense of a normal state of mind to start processing it? I mean, normal state of mind? Like, just recently. (laughs) Um, Yeah, in the immediate aftermath, there was this sort of shock that I think my my brain was in still a survival mode in a way that I didn't realize. You know, you've you've made it out. um, And I felt great. I felt great. I was like, holy shit, I lived. I am doing the only thing in the world that I want to do, that I thought I'd never get to do again, I'm going back to my family. I can't believe it, right? So many people that day were not that fortunate. And so I thought, it's it's awesome, right? Like, I'm, I'm great. I, I even sent emails, you know, to my colleagues saying, <laughs> I'll probably be out of, uh, out of touch for the next couple of days, make sure the ball doesn't get dropped on this or that project. You know, I was making jokes. I went to lunch with my family. Um, I was talking very openly about my experience. Um, I felt great. And then after about three days, maybe that's, maybe that's the point you're making. Maybe my brain was processing again, but after about three days, um, I started to, I guess, unravel would be the word that I would use. I would try to get in my bed to go to sleep at night and I would just start to panic. I'd be like, you know waiting for a bomb to go off right outside my window and I'd start shaking and crying. Um, and it's, (laughs) this is the thing about 
the fallout from tragedy is, you know, people might say, oh, well, why, why didn't you just try harder? Why couldn't you get over it? And it, it's not like that. You know, I, I would have loved to just, just be over it or, or not struggle in the way that I was struggling, but there's a neurological response to that tragedy, right? We've, we've created so many new neural pathways that tell us getting in your bed is inherently dangerous. You've gotten in bed. That's how bombs go off. Get the fuck up. Get out. Right? Because you were in bed when the first bomb went off. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yep. okay, yeah, yep. yeah, so yeah. sleep became, I, I couldn't, I was maybe sleeping oh two God. hours a night and I was nightmaring really, oh. really badly um, when I could get to sleep at all. And, and so that's one of those things that just like, that's just a neural pathway that's been created. And that's why I talk about it so openly, right? Like I'm not ashamed uh, of the fallout. I think I was at the time. But now that I've studied it, now that I work in this space, now that I understand it, there's literally nothing to be ashamed of. Those are new neural pathways that your brain has built to help you survive, right? You know, if you were a, a, a caveman and you encountered a lion's den and you barely got out of there alive, you wouldn't go back in the den, right? Your brain's like, fuck, don't do that. It's dangerous. That happens to us. Same thing, right? Same process. Except, yeah, mine was getting into bed. And you can't just logic your way out of it. It doesn't work that way. You can sit there and be like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. My bed is not dangerous. You're not fine. <laughs> you have to rebuild that neural pathway. And it's a ton of work. You have, to, you have to show your brain that its processing is incorrect. And you have to retrain it. It's, it's hard work. So, so what was the shame piece? It was, it was the fact that you were being irrationally... Yeah. Uh, an irrational res emotional response to something. The shame for me was, I think what my brain was saying at the time was, you're such a thankless piece of shit. That was what I heard the most. You're such a thankless piece of shit. All you wanted was to get out of there alive, and you did. All you wanted was to make it back to your family, and you did. Were these conscious thoughts, mainly? I, I mean, y yeah, in a way, right? Because I was writing all the time. I was journaling all the time just to try to quiet the, the madness in my head. Um, and I had never dealt with anything like that before, so I really didn't understand what was, what was happening. Um, but I was writing all the time, and I would write that stuff. I'm a piece of shit. I don't deserve to be here. I didn't deserve to live through this. But I think what I didn't have was the ability to step one step back and say, okay, this is what my brain is saying to me. This is what I'm hearing. Is it right or wrong? Why do I hear that, right? And that's survivor's guilt. That's how survivor's guilt works. So you go, there are so many people who didn't make it out. And now I'm here. And all I can do is lie in my bed and sob. I didn't deserve to get out. I don't deserve to be here. And that was, that was on a loop all the time in my brain until I just wanted to die. I remember saying to my family, I wish I had died there. I should have died there. Because what was the point of making it out to be like this? That's how I felt. But I wish I had had one, one step back, a little bit more distance, just enough to say, that's a symptom. That's a symptom of the fallout, right? That's survivor's guilt. That's PTSD. And that's what's talking to you right now. And it's not right. And you're not stuck like this forever. And it is worth making it through this. And you can. But I, I, it, was, it was impossible to see that stuff at that time for me. The journaling's interesting. So I, mm -hmm. I've, I don't think I've, maybe in the past I've heard it mentioned to people, other people have mentioned it to them as a, as a I'm going to say coping mechanism. Sure. It's, not, it's not a coping mechanism. It's, it's drilling down a level deeper than where you're mentally at. You thought, you're putting yourself in a different space. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, uh, I've been writing recently over the last six months a year, just on and off yeah. for not for no particular reason other than purely to inform my thought, yeah. to just think a little bit deeper. And that's part of the problem with, I think, you know, in, in that mental state thereafter, whatever yeah. the situation has been to bring it to that mental state is yeah. because it's new to you, you're in a new situation. You don't even realize that it's not what it should be. You exactly. think this is where, this is my mind. Yeah. This is where I'm at. This is what I'm thinking. So yeah. it must be right. Yeah. And I've got this issue. It must be. An, this must be the issue as opposed to what you said. Absolutely. The symptom. Yeah. Symptom. Did you? How did you go? What did you do 
to get help, if anything? I mean, how, yeah, how did that take that step? Got so much help. Love help. That doesn't play well help. into the shame bit, does it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to say one thing about what you were saying just now, that, that we hear that and we think, yeah, that's that's my mind. This is who I am. You know, it must be right. This is what I feel. Um, and this is something I try to tell people all the time now, is that every human being knows pain. Every human being knows pain, right? Even a sociopath who can't feel empathy knows what pain feels like. And so it's crazy that our tendency when we're really in pain is to isolate, right? I, I didn't want to tell anyone what I was thinking and feeling, and I felt so broken. And in feeling so broken, I felt so alone. You know, I felt so alone. And as I know now, especially after releasing the book, is like, I am not that special, okay? I was not alone. I was having the same symptoms as literally millions of people out there. And so I wish that we were better at knowing when we're feeling pain that we're in good company, that so many people are also hurting, right? Um, instead, of, instead of isolating, instead of l like looking inward and, and pulling away from everybody because such a big step to healing is like knowing that what you're going through is normal. And so... Yes, I did get help. I, I got a trauma therapist. Actually, the FBI got me a trauma therapist. So like huge shout out to the FBI. I love them. They also saved my life 100% by, by getting me the help that I needed. And the first thing my therapist said to me, actually, the first thing she did was she handed me a questionnaire to fill out a list of, of symptoms, basically. Are you experiencing these like 20 things? And to what extent are you experiencing them? And it was like someone looked inside my brain. It was so crazy. Like, Go on. Like yeah, it's just every symptom. I was like, yeah, I have that. Oh, my God, I have that, too. Like, where did you get this fucking questionnaire? Like, this is everything I'm experiencing. And that was the first moment that my brain could allow the idea that tons of other people were experiencing this, too. So many, in fact, that it's been boiled down to these 20 questions. And so it must be normal or at least not unusual, right? And that was really cool. There was something so comforting in that. You're not broken. You're not beyond reaching. You're not uniquely alone. This is what trauma does to our brains. We know exactly what you have and we know how to fix it. How, how debilitating was the situation? Did you, like, we, because you mentioned you were talking to work colleagues beforehand, messing about and all the rest yeah. of it. What situation were you in? In, when you're in that mental state and, and I mean, you mentioned one point, what wishing that the survivor girl, you wouldn't, you yeah. hadn't have survived, I think. hundred um, percent. I feel like, I feel like I have to defend myself. It's, so I'll just give you the answer. It was, I was, it was extremely debilitating. I couldn't work. I couldn't read. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't leave my apartment. Like, yeah, everything that I loved to do, I couldn't do. What was stopping you? Um, fear on a level that it's hard to put into words, right? Like I would open my door to try to leave my apartment and have a panic attack. Like full scale, fall down, huddle into a ball, sobbing, panic attack. The terrorists are here. They found me. Of course they found me. They know my name. They know where I live. They're waiting for me outside. Why would I ever leave my apartment, right? And those are the thoughts, like you said, that they feel true because they're running on a loop. And that's, again, that's what I was saying about it's really hard to turn fight or flight back off especially when it's been on for so long. And and think about the people who experience it for days or months or years or part of their job, right? Like it's so hard to turn that back off, that alertness, that, that you know, f for me especially it was the fear. It was this belief that I didn't know what was safe. I thought that hotel was perfectly safe. I never thought twice about it, but I was wrong. I thought my bed was safe, but I was wrong. And so then it was everything. Well, fuck, if, if a hotel, if a five-star hotel isn't safe when I'm traveling for work, what is? It felt like nothing was. Um, so it was extremely debilitating. And then, you know, I'm sleeping like two hours a night. Um, so that'll make anyone crabby and not, not great to be around. And then um, the flashbacks were constant. So I'd sit down, I'd try to read a book. I love to read, right? And suddenly everything, I'm, I'm literally just back in that bathroom. I can hear the sounds. I can smell the smells. I can feel the feelings. I'm shaking. My hands are shaking. And I'm, I'm thinking about what I need to text my parents next. But I'm sitting in my apartment in California. Um, so yeah, it was extremely debilitating. 
I shouldn't and I don't need to defend myself. But, you know, for anyone who's interested, it might be worth knowing that I was a super high achiever before this, right? I mean, I, I worked at Google and I had a kick-ass job and a great salary and like, you know, everybody looked at me as like that, that perfectionist who has a great resume um, and I went to a great school and I got great grades and like, you know, everything in my life I had tried really hard and I had succeeded. And then suddenly I was facing this thing that no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't beat it, not by myself. When was that realization that you couldn't do it by yourself? Because I think that's one of the biggest things, especially, um, I mean, you know, when we associate, when we talk about PTSD, you people most of the time will make a direct association there in the head to, oh, military. Yeah. And then the people who don't, maybe don't understand it, will then say, oh, how can, how can someone like that get PTSD? They've been prepared for it or they're mentally resilient or X, Y, mm -hmm. Z. And you I bring it up because you mentioned about the high achievement piece. Mm -hmm. It's that one, it's the, the, the third party perception of, what you should and shouldn't be affected by, maybe totally, because yeah. we know who you really are, sure. and this is all rubbish, right? Sure. Um, and your own acceptance of, I to your point, I can't fix this myself. Man, <laughs> I would say the number one person who thought they could tell me that I shouldn't be affected by it was me. I, I mean, that was the voice in my head all the time. Why are you being so weak? Right? You're a badass. You're, you know, you are great at stuff. Just try harder, just do better, just get over it, get past it. Um, and that's actually like, it's a really bad thing. It's a really terrible voice to hear in your head because it really retards your ability to get better because you're saying to yourself all day long, you should be able to kick this, why haven't you? You suck, you're so weak, just get over it. Um, and so it was really, I would say it was at the time that I accepted the fact that I wanted to be dead, that I would rather be dead than be doing what I was doing because at that point, the voice shut off, right? Like, it's not your week, get over it. It's like, well, all is lost. So what does it matter? And so at that time, the FBI told me that I probably had PTSD. I said, I literally said, I do not have PTSD. I don't deserve to have PTSD. That's what I said, right? Not that like, who would you ever wish that upon? Nobody. But I was like, I didn't fight the terrorists. I don't have PTSD. Um, but I did have PTSD. <laughs> Um, and civilians can have it, which is, is, you know, good to know. Um, anyone who's been through something super shitty can have it, right? Something dark, something really trying can have PTSD. Um, and they said, you need to go to a therapist. And I thought, sure. Right. That's what rock bottom is. Like, okay. I'll try anything. Do I think it'll work? No. But am I going to keep lying here wishing I was dead instead? No, okay, I'll go to an appointment. Um, and I believed it would work uh, probably the first time that my therapist told me that it was totally normal, that my response was totally normal, that we know how to fix it, and that I wasn't stuck like that forever. I was like, you know, I think she could have, I would have joined a cult if like to anyone who, who said that to me at the time, I would have done anything that person wanted because I wanted to believe that so badly. I wanted to find who I was again so badly or, or figure out, you know, who I was going to be as a survivor of this experience. And I wanted to get off of my fucking floor and stop crying. And more than anything, I wanted to stop making my family miserable. That was, that was, that was horrific. I take it that was because they were so worried about you. Oh. No, it was because I was unbearable. I was, I was really, I've never dealt with rage in my life, right? You know me. I don't know if you would expect me to be a very uh, enraged person. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, right? I don't expect myself to be a very enraged person. And I was just, I mean, I was screaming at them. I was hanging up on them. I was, you know, you don't understand. Why the fuck would you ever say that to me? And I, like when I say screaming, I mean screaming. Like, and I... I have a rule in my relationships. I don't raise my voice. You know, I don't believe that it adds anything to my ability to communicate typically. And I was screaming, you know, you're an asshole. I can't believe you would say that to me. And it just, and, the, and then, and then I would cry and feel so guilty. Like the okay. whole reason I wanted to live was to get back to these people. Now I'm treating them like trash and I can't stop treating them like trash, but it was, it wasn't who I was. That's the thing. Like, 
that is the PTSD. That is the symptom. And that's not me like, like trying to blame something or like, oh, you know, I shouldn't have to hold myself accountable. I 100% I hold myself accountable for everything I said. And I have made apologies for everything that I said, but I couldn't get to the point where I could stop doing it and start apologizing until I got therapy, until the PTSD wasn't front and center in my brain anymore. So I, I keep myself accountable for that hundred percent. But if I want to be an accountable, responsible adult, I had to go get better so that I could stop doing those things. So you have to recognize like these are a symptom and I can, I can get better and then I don't have to act like this anymore. Mm. You, made a really important, you made a really important point earlier. It's, it's been getting on my nerves a bit over the last couple of years, mm. especially since I've been doing this and sort of speaking to more and more people about it on, on, on the topic mm -hmm. is the point you made about civil <laughs> I mean, it's even a ridiculous statement. No, like, sure. you know what you and I know, it's a ridiculous statement to even have to say. It's like, civ civilians can get PTSD. Mm -hmm. It's like, as it, it's all we have to say as if PTSD is exclusively military. Back to the point. No, it's, it's, it's not, you know, I, and I just want to highlight, I want to highlight that point because yeah. I do think there are a lot, a lot of people who are suffering from PTSD yeah. symptoms of, or similar to, for whatever reasons, but to, from a trauma yeah. or traumas, um, that they've experienced at some point and they're not one they they don't you almost you're going back to that uh, self-awareness emotional awareness they don't realize yeah they're probably unhappy in themselves yeah they know it's an issue they yeah. don't know what you do to fix it they don't even go get help with it yeah they accept it almost a lot of the time as character traits yeah personality traits that came yeah. out of x y z time exactly you know um and onto the sorry it's on the point of trauma trauma is like it's relative and it's a pretty ob sure. objective thing. Your idea of trauma is different than my idea of trauma totally. in terms of levels. And with, when those levels, the way you get impacted by yeah. a traumatic event is different to the way I get back. In. Now, I'm not saying that I am better at handling it because it depends what it yeah, is. It's exactly. anything. That's the same for everyone. Absolutely. I know people in the military that, um, you know, I suffer with issues yeah. for, and I can't work out to this day what particular incident it was, right? Because there's yeah. a shed load. Sure. But I know people who have been in some crazy stuff, yep. much crazier than me, yep. loads of it, and they walk around like they have been a postman for all their lives <laughs> and they've never had a day of stress in their lives. Sure. And you go, why is that? Different, like different genetic makeup. Sure. And, and, and it's another thing people need to accept, you know, you can, like you were saying, High achiever, you can achieve yeah. anything in the world. I'll get through life. I'll play. I can. I can cope with anything you throw at yep. me. And then you get thrown a curveball. And you're like, oh my god. Yep. <laughs> I am worthless. <laughs> yeah. I man. Well, okay. I'm a real nerd. So now I'm gonna spit some stats at you because I work in this space now, right? Um, but the vast majority of people who have PTSD will never get any sort of help. Over sixty percent of them, right? And so that's the stat. When people ask me, like, oh, what keeps you up at night these days? Um, the fact that two thirds of people with PTSD will never get any help. That how do you know that? How, why does that stat come from research wise? Uh, that actually comes from the veteran community specifically. So I think it's at least that number because um, that's where the vast majority of the research happens. But to, as a segue into that point, um, you know, the trauma that's most likely to lead to PTSD, the trauma that leads to PTSD most often is actually rape, right? Which, when you think about it, Totally makes sense. Very intuitive. So many associated feelings of guilt and shame and helplessness. Um, but in fact, rape is actually, uh, I read a study that says rape is twice as likely to lead to PTSD as combat. Um, and we think of, we think of PTSD as, as synonymous with the military community and it, it is a huge problem and it's massively undiagnosed and it goes untreated way too often, as I just said, um, but it does affect people outside of that as well. And and I think it's great that there is an association, right? 20 years ago, you would have said PTSD and people would have said, oh, that's not a real thing. So at least now you say it and people say, yeah, the military has that. Um, but I hope 20 years from now, or you know, I hope a lot sooner, people can say, that's what happens to our brains when we go through a traumatic experience. And then exactly to your point, there's no point comparing traumas. People get really stuck on this a lot. Oh, I don't deserve to have a bunch of mental fallout because this person I know went through something way worse than I did, worse than I did, and they're fine. But it, you said it exactly right. It literally is a product of your your biology, your genetics, the way you were raised, the way you think. 
and, and you don't have control over it. Like it's not, you just, you just have PTSD or you don't. And there are tests, you know, you can, anyone can go online right now and take the PCL5 and it'll tell you if you're having, you know, symptoms that, that look like PTSD. And so, you know, there's just, there, uh, yeah, so many people have it and they don't know so many people have it and they never get treated. And so I just wish it was more of a conversation. And I think so often it's not because people feel ashamed or they believe that trauma left me so broken that this is just who I am now. And that's not true either. That's the feeling that makes me the saddest. That is a massive thing. Yeah. And I was guilty of that at one point. Yeah. And, um, and you know, it was, yeah, I, I won't put the details why. I don't want to drop anyone in the crap, right? But yeah, you're right. Um, there was a realization moment with me where I realized, hang on a minute. So there is a way I can get back to maybe something of what I was yeah. before, or at least to a position where I prefer, <laughs> it's preferable to what I am now. Exactly. And a lot, I think a lot of the time, especially, and this is especially with the military, I think, yeah. is that the the PTSD piece or the mental illness piece is unfortunately worn as a badge of honor, which mm. is a complete inhibitor. Interesting. To moving forward and getting it sorted out yeah. or accepting that you have improved or X, Y, Z. Sure. It becomes an intrinsic part of your personality. Yeah. And without it, you're in your mind, you're something less in the to third parties, That's people, so onlookers, friends, family. You think it'd be something yeah. less because all of a sudden you aren't this wounded animal. Mm. <laughs> I'll tell you what I wear as a badge of honor: my treatment, <laughs> getting better, because it's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Um, you know, I, people might think the school I went to was hard. Like, try trauma treatment. It's it's grueling. It's hard. Why? What was? What did you find so difficult about it? Well, I think to put it simply, right, one of those symptoms of PTSD is avoidance. Again, that's our brains trying to protect us. So you you might find that, okay, so I was really afraid of hotels, right? I never, ever wanted to go back into a hotel, ever. <laughs> that's like, I don't know, horrible place, don't go there. Um, and so I just, I literally had the thought, that's fine. That's fine. I never need to stay in a hotel again, okay? Might need to travel for business. Airbnb is a thing. Totally fine. Don't need it. Better without it. I'm cool. We're good. And again, that's your brain, right? That's the lion's den. Don't go back in there. And and so we we have such a high level of avoidance. And so even facing the PTSD, even going back to therapy, talking about it, trying to work through what's happening cognitively and build those new neural pathways, every bone in my body wanted to avoid that. Dude, don't go to therapy. This stuff sucks. You have to relive everything that happened to you. It's horrible. Just don't go. Right? Like, it's not that bad. Like, whatever. Lie on your floor and cry some more. You know? That's better than going to therapy. And so every bone in my body wanted to avoid it. And again, that's a symptom. That's why PTSD is so hard to treat because one of the symptoms is avoidance. Um, so, yeah. I'm, I'm, I was not proud of myself at the time. I, I, I didn't feel a lot of pride. But looking back, am I really proud? When I look at the graph of my PTSD symptoms and I think about the work that went into bringing that line down, yeah, I'm proud of it. It's literally framed. It is a badge of honor. It's hanging on my wall. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of any person who has tried to get help for this. It's hard. It's so hard. Are you the same person now as you were before, personality-wise? Um, no. no. No, I never will. I was going to say that when you were talking earlier. You said, you know, get back to who I was or at least something that's better than than this. That took me a long time to make peace with. And I think that was a big part of healing for me was um, I want to be that girl again. And the truth of the matter is that girl had never seen a leg detached from a suicide bomber lying in a courtyard. That girl can't have seen that, right? That girl in, in a lot of ways, you know, for all intents and purposes, that girl died in that attack in a lot of ways. And I'll never be that girl again. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. I am genuinely today. I am okay with that, but it took me a long time, probably a year. Of, of work in the aftermath until I could stop saying, you know, why did this happen to me? I wish I was still that girl. I loved that girl. I was proud of that girl. That girl worked hard and kicked ass and, you know, was great at her job and whatever. Um, and so it was really in, and this sounds so cliche, I'm sorry, but I had to figure out who I was after the attack, who I was as a survivor. And 
the thing that I could hold on to was I'm someone who believes in helping others. I'm someone who believes in helping others. I believe in that. And I wanted to see if I could help anyone who was feeling what I felt in the aftermath of that attack, who was feeling like they'd rather be dead. And I think, you know, that's, that's what I do now. That's what I do at work. It's, it's why I released the book. I just, I want people to know that they're not alone and that they can get better. And I want them to know what it looks and feels like to not believe that and still be able to get better. Mm. It's what is a really interesting thing that you ended up with the journaling that, yeah. that you did that from the start and in the, in the ways that you did it. Uh, because, uh, correct me if I explain this wrong, but you, you essentially had two types of journaling going mm-hmm. on. You had the one which is recollecting events yep. of the day, yep. uh, or, or before or after, yep. and then the one that was talking about feelings, the emotional side of stuff, right, and dealing with and trying to understand what was going down. Yep. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's probably the main reason why the podcast came about, and I'm excited to have you today, because yeah. you're talking about helping people. Seeing, reading the words in the book, mm-hmm. knowing that that is from journals that you actually wrote that stuff at the time. Yeah. It's not you a year later, two years later going, oh, let's try to remember how I felt then and then put it into words. Mm. And because it was done at the time, and when you read those, my God, it connects. Like so much stuff in there connects. When you think how different our backgrounds are, yeah. completely different, so much of it connects. And some of it connects just through, through you know, um, uh, compa- comparable uh mental health experiences and other stuff just connects because it's just a dis- dis- just descriptions of pain and experiences and unusual circumstances that are unusual to most people yeah. except a very small proportion of those in the world yeah. and 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 reading those on paper it again coming back to your point earlier you said you realized you weren't the only person in the world to be going through that stuff now i sort of had that realization reading that book when my god it's not just me and my buddies it's like there's like women and civilians and like normal people out there have gone through this and it's 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 an incredible realization right because i think that what you uh, what you have gone through and go through it it, it's a journey you know from the ptsd to to overcoming it to getting wherever you're going to be in 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years time, right? Sure. Um, that is, those lessons you're learning are applicable across the board, yeah? What's brought you to those lessons are, is unique. Your story is unique, sure. right? But you get to a position yeah. and because you're able to explain those to people, then people who are unaware of them and those lessons and those th- those those bits of knowledge that can literally save someone's life when they're at their darkest time the bottom of the pit are hugely important what i what i <coughs> what i like about this is those unique stories are the ones that they, they draw people in yeah i'm drawn to your story and i heard about your story and then i read the book and i read through it and i had that realization holy shit connect 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 Learn, 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 learn. Like we were talking about b- before before we started the interview. I, I read it on the Kindle. Yeah. And it's the only thing I've read on the Kindle that I ever, ever made notes on or highlighted passages. There's so much in there. From little things right where you would there's a line in there and I would I put a note in and it and it's it would say, for example, disassociation. Or it, I, <laughs> and, and there's one bit in there where your therapist said something. And I've literally highlighted the passage because it a penny drop moment for me oh Jesus and I've looked at the passage you've, of your therapist and I've just put genius <laughs> <laughs> awesome. genius genius and uh, that yep. was the piece about uh, I think where you were talking about you were guilty for wanting to tell your parents and tell your family and tell your loved ones and tell your husband about the situation you were in yeah I think that's right. And then your therapist rationalized it and said, why are you feeling guilty? Do you want to explain that bit? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I felt a ton of guilt in the aftermath for what I put. See, and even now, like even this language isn't right. And this is why it's so important to me, what you said. These are real journal entries from when I was going through it because I couldn't write that book today. I would, I would you know, use a lot of flowery language and try to say, oh, it hurt, but I was fine, you know. <laughs> But I wasn't fine. I was super messed up. 
and that's what that's what I think people relate to. And so I, I, you know, I was tearing up when you were saying how much that connected. Um, again, connection and pain, that's a real thing. And it helps us heal. Um, so I felt really guilty in the aftermath. And I felt like I had to put my family through this horrific experience that that they would never fully be able to get over. That they had to sit, you know, my parents especially, I think about them all the time, that they had to sit in Ohio across the world and just wonder, was that the last text I'll ever get from my daughter? Is she being violently murdered right now? And I, I felt all this guilt. If I hadn't gone there, if I, if I had stayed at home, if I had made it to the interview on time, they wouldn't have had to go through that. And that's all my fault. Everything that I put, that they went through for those 17 hours, that's on me. And I really believed that. And even now when I say it, I'm like, no, like, let's blame the terrorists, shall we? Right? Like, hey, maybe if you weren't, if extremists weren't trying to violently murder you, your parents wouldn't be struggling. Um, but that's how I felt at the time. And I was, I was saying that to my therapist and she said, if you truly believed you were going to die right now, what's the first thing you would do? I thought I would text my parents and say, I love them. She's like, did you do that in the attack? And I was like, well, yeah. Then how can you feel guilty? You did exactly the right thing. You said goodbye. You said that you love them. The people who were trying to kill you, that's on them. And something just clicked. Like, that makes so much sense to me sitting here today. But at that time, that was life-changing. Taking some of that guilt off of me, that was life-changing. Yeah. We make a mistake. We People do this. Yeah. The survivor's guilt thing. Or you go back and you and think X, Y, Z, did do this. And absolutely. It's we we think back to the situation with the knowledge we have now, exactly, and we forget about the knowledge we had at the time, exactly. And that's really common, yeah. really common. And you go over even we're not even talking trauma victims here, yeah. Just people who make a wrong decision in life, totally. And you go, I should have said that. Did X, Y, Z. You know, yeah. have you got any regrets? <laughs> and you go, yeah. maybe my regret at the moment is, yeah, I keep battering myself because I'm making judging decisions on right. what I know now and not then, right? Exactly. Um, it's, just, it's a super important thing that most people don't understand, I think. And that's, again, this is why I love working in this space because it makes sense that we do that. That's a survival mechanism, right? Your brain goes, oh, something bad happened. Let's replay it so that we can ensure that we don't do it again. And especially in an extreme you know, survival situation, your brain, your brain says, well, you almost died. We definitely don't want that to happen again. Let's replay it and figure out what we should have done differently, right? And so you start replaying it all the time, all the things I, sh I could have done or should have done or would do if this happened again. And, and you start to live in that and you forget this was the information I had at that time, not the information I have today. So would I do things differently if I lived it again? Sure. Did I have that knowledge then? No. So you can't act on knowledge you don't have, period. So it's it's there's a difference between how do I keep myself safe in the future and feeling guilty about knowledge you didn't have? You just didn't have it. When you say you work in this space now, what mm -hmm. are you doing now? Uh, yeah, um, I do a few things. So my book came out a month ago, so I do a lot of talks. Um, sometimes I even do podcasts for my book. No way. Uh, yeah, no. Amazing. Cool. That's yeah. Get you on. Um, but uh, what I do sort of uh, for my job on a daily basis is um, – I created an app for other survivors that helps them get uh, evidence-based trauma treatment protocols at home on their own time in a self-help manner because, well, for two reasons, for two really strong reasons. One, my therapy cost $8,000, 8000 US dollars to get the therapy that I needed to save my life that I paid out of pocket. And the FBI ultimately reimbursed me. So like another huge shout out to the FBI because they're amazing. Um, but most people can't do that, right? Most people can't take every Tuesday, Thursday afternoon off to drive across town to pay $450 an hour to a trauma therapist that, by the way, you probably don't even know how to find in the first place. I still don't know how to find them. The FBI was like, go here. Um, so it was just life-saving trauma treatment is so inaccessible. And to me, like, that's unacceptable, especially when you think about all the service members who end up taking their own lives because of this. Like, how can we sleep at night? when this therapy is so inaccessible. It's, it's, just, it's just not acceptable. And the second reason is um, because a lot of people aren't ready to talk to someone. A lot of people aren't ready to talk to someone. You talk to someone, you know, I've, I've heard from a lot of people in the military who say, yeah, I think I have that, but why should I go sit and, and pour out my life experience to someone who could never understand me, some civilian who can't understand what it's like to fight in a war, 
to watch someone die, to take someone's life. I'm not going to tell them. And I think instead of trying, standing there and trying to convince them that they should, like, let's accept that. Okay, some people aren't ready to talk to someone. So what can we offer those people? Same for rape survivors, right? Maybe you're not ready to sit in a room and tell someone about how you were violently raped. That's fair. So what, what solutions can we offer to those people? So I, I wanted to offer them something that was cheap, that didn't have a wait list, that anyone could do at home on their own time, um, that didn't require them to talk to someone. You can work with a therapist and use the app if you want to, but if you're not ready to work with a therapist yet, you can just use the app. So you still have an option. And that's what was important to me. So explain the app. Yeah. Yeah, the app um, is on iPhone and it's called Trauma Brace. And it's it starts out with the questionnaire that I was talking about, my favorite questionnaire, um, that goes through your, your symptoms and, and you say to what degree you're experiencing these things. And then it sort of makes a recommendation like, yeah, this app might be useful for you or, or you know, maybe this isn't the right thing for you to use. Um, and then it goes through and it helps you rebuild those neural actually you help yourself which is what's so amazing rebuild those neural pathways so you know for me right if i was afraid of hotels the app would help me slowly and gradually bring those stimuli back into my life instead of avoiding them by rebuilding those neural pathways so that i can say okay this hotel is not inherently dangerous but you expose yourself gradually a little bit at a time um, it helps you work through the memory so that instead of when something reminds you of the traumatic experience going like I'm going to stuff that into a box in my brain and compartmentalize it really, really far away and just cross my fingers that it never comes back up, which by the way, it will, um, taking control of that memory so that you genuinely feel like you're in control of it. That memory comes up when I bring it out and I decide to engage with it. Other than that, it's in its filing cabinet and it stays in its drawer, um, which is a feeling a lot of trauma survivors can't even imagine. So it really focuses on um, getting you back to a healthy relationship with the memory and getting you to a healthy relationship with the memory and getting you back to a lot of stimuli that, that you've started to avoid that you might not even realize you're avoiding. And through that um, can actually bring down, you know, you yourself can bring down your PTSD symptoms. It's super cool. I think the people who do the app are so badass. Like I think about that all the time. No help, no therapist to hold you accountable. You're in your living room holding yourself accountable, working your way through the app when you feel like total crap, like hats off to anyone who's ever worked through the app. I think they're so cool. Yeah. I, it, it's also hopefully for those, for, for people, like a gateway to those who do need the input. Totally. Because one of the things, as you know, mm -hmm. is when you are like that, the last thing you want to do is speak to someone. 100%. The last thing you want to do is speak to someone. 100%. You know? And I say that's one of my favorite outcomes too. Like some people use the app, they'll use it for, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever. And they'll say, wow, I actually can talk about this. I'm going to, I'm going to go get some therapy because I've, I'm ready to talk about it now. And like, that's amazing to me. Right. I love that. I love that for someone because it just gives you a bridge when, when you feel like there's no way across an abyss. Yeah, definitely. So I've, I've passed the book to shed a lot of people. It looks like I'll be, I'll be <laughs> passing the, uh, to, uh, the, the app to shed a lot of people as well. Honestly, the I, book, appreciate that. I mean, We'll finish off in a couple of minutes, but the, the book, in all honesty, the, it is incredible. Thank you. Um, and when I when I read it, the first thing I did was message you and say, "Oh, my, holy shit!" And then I started firing the people, say, "Need to read this. Need to read this. Need." To, and they're all people I I know who um, who are at different stages of just dealing with just dealing with stuff, just sure. dealing with stuff. Aren't we all? Um, with or stuff. they're close to someone who's dealing with stuff. Yeah. Got, read this, read this. Because one, it's for the people who are dealing with stuff and two, it's for understanding. That's the other part of it. Like, again, going back to that unique story of yours, I looked at it, read about read your journal, read about your journey and I understood things better about how, how people deal with stuff that I've never dealt with. Sure. So I've got no first-hand experience in sure. several aspects of it. But I could see, oh man, okay, that makes sense now. I see why certain behaviors and characteristics and stuff is like this in yeah. people who are certain in suffering in this way from PTSD F like fascinating and hugely important for me um yeah, in understanding you. so question for you the ju the book is made out of your journal entries mm. but still when you put the book together mm -hmm. how did that impact you doing the book did that did mm. that what was that 
like when you put the book together and published that. Yeah. That takes some balls. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I remember my therapist saying to me at the time that I was basically doing like double duty therapy, right? I'd like go in, talk to her about everything, go home, write about everything, talk to her, write about stuff. Um, but at the same time, right, like that was what was happening in my brain all the time. I was reliving that experience. So so writing about it was really very helpful in a way to to get it out of my head and onto a piece of paper. But and I'm I'm doing this with my hand like a pen, but I was typing. Um but I people I, I get this a lot. Oh, you're so brave for sharing your story. Um I didn't think very hard about it. I still don't. I would never take that story back. I would never not share it to anyone who wants to to listen or to read it. Because what I said to my husband when I was lying on the floor crying was, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Why am I not strong like those other people who have gone through really bad things and they've, they've gotten through it and, in fact, are better for it, right? That's something we hear all the time. Oh, I'm stronger because of what I went through. I'm not like that. I'm a wreck. So I don't have whatever that person has. And in reality, what I know now is just that nobody fucking talks about what happens in between. Nobody talks about, I went through this horrible thing. Then I cried on my floor for two years until I got a therapist or until I found something that helped me or I did, you know, I did MDMA or ketamine, whatever it is that helps you or until I found this sport, whatever it is. And now I can deal with it. Now I'm getting stronger for it. Now I'm better for it or, or just better. You know, you don't have to be better because a really bad thing happened to you. Um, Nobody talks about that healing period in between. And I don't know why, because the truth of the matter is everyone who's dealt with PTSD, it wasn't pretty. Like it's, it's bad. It's ugly. And it makes you literally want to die. But I thought that if I can put this book out there and one person who's lying on their floor, who wants to die, who's saying, I'm the only one who is this weak, can read it and say, oh my God, I'm not the only one. And she looked this bad. It was bad, you guys. She looked this bad and she got better. So I must be able to do it, right? I must be able to. I wanted that for people because I didn't have it. I couldn't point to a story that that I felt looked like mine that I could think of. And so it's not about like, oh, being brave and sharing my story. It's just about it would have made such a difference to me. And so it's almost selfish in that way. It's like, this is what I wish I had when I was going through it. So I can't imagine not talking about it. I don't know. Well, it's an incredible book. And it's already helping people. As you know, as you know, I'm sure it's going to help many, many more. Chuck it out there, man. (laughs) Get it out there. It's on Amazon, right? Yeah, the book is called Terrorist Attack Girl. Um, and it's on Amazon and then I narrated the audiobook myself. So that's on yes. audible. Audiobook. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. There's an audio book. Um, so if you're not sick of my voice yet after this long, you know, there's more for you to listen to out there. <laughs> um, and then the app is called trauma brace and it's on the iOS app store anywhere that, that you would look for that. So yeah, strongly advise anyone to get the book, read through it. I, and all audio book it. Um, and I just want to say, for anyone who does read it and wants to reach out to me, like, please do. I really do. I respond to the messages and, and the comments and the reviews that I get. Um, and I've heard so many, so many stories and, and powerful responses that way. So, um, you know, reach out to me, share your story. I love, I love to connect over this stuff. That's, that's why I do it. Perfect. What have we not mentioned? Anything you want to mention? That's my Instagram handle is my name, Maylie Chapin. Um, yeah, and the book and the app, that's what I do. So Easy peasy. Merry yeah. Chapman, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, you. Back at you. Cool. That's it. Thank you for watching Hey Chower. If you enjoyed this episode, why not become a Hey Chower patron? Hey Chower patrons get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched there are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the hr patrons so before this podcast was recorded i recorded an exclusive q a a shorter interview structured around eight questions all the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand and that interview is online now for patrons that happens every time Patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else. They get advanced viewing of the episodes. 
and you also get other perks and bonuses. All of the information is on charliecharlie1.com. Just hit the menu item, become a patron. It'll show you everything there, including access to the H-Hour Discord community and private patron-only channels on there. So go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item, become a patron. Easy peasy. If you prefer to listen to your podcast normally, H-Hour is also on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's on all of the podcast apps. And if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app, you can go to the, the H-Hour website, charliechannel1.com, and you can actually play the podcast, video or audio, directly through the website, through your browser. Simples. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a supporter. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you.